Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. Okay, guys, welcome to the podcast today. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about uh, this sort of confusing issue around the types of exercise that we should be doing. We've all heard the arguments, should I be doing cardio, should I not, is it going to reduce my muscle mass, is it going to raise my cortisol levels too high, should I be doing weight training, what type of weight training, is yoga useful, like all these questions about what type of exercise we should be doing. To start out, I want to make a distinction that I've made an awful lot, even in this podcast, about the differences between exercise and movement, because we first have to get that covered. Some people say that humans are built to run. Uh, That is really not true, but we definitely are built to walk. I mean, obviously, we have two legs. Before we had horses, before we had cars, we had to move for millions of years of our existence as a species. And so movement is built into our genes. We must move. Obviously, we now live in an environment where we do not have to move. We can sit much of the time. So our movement and our metabolism, which is completely and utterly built around movement, is something that we have got to bring back into our lifestyles. Now, this gets confusing because people say, well, Jade, that's just exercise, isn't it? Actually, walking and exercise are two different things. And it's funny because I used to see them as the same as well until we started learning a little bit more about science and the particular attributions of different uh, metabolic parameters. For example, we now know that there is a difference between non-exercise associated thermogenesis or the calories that we burn when we're just moving around through our day, walking from point A to point B, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, doing the laundry, gardening, fidgeting, sex, all of these things that are not necessarily structured exercise add up in a very big way to our total daily caloric expenditure. This is called non-exercise because it's not based in exercise, associated thermogenesis, NEAT, N-E-A-T. Now, if you don't like that big, long science term, then just call it the activities of daily movement. Everything you're doing throughout the day except for structured exercise. Then, of course, there is what we call the thermic effect of exercise, or TEE, or you could just call it exercise-associated thermogenesis. They're the two things. They're they're the same thing, synonymous. Uh, So TEE, thermic effect of exercise, or exercise-associated thermogenesis is the amount of calories we burn when we do structured exercise. That is different than the movement-based stuff. So before I really get into discussion, this discussion, I want to talk about the idea that first and foremost and most importantly, you have got to have an adequate base of NEAT, non-exercise-associated thermogenesis. Walking. 10,000 to 20,000 steps per day. Your metabolism does not care whether that is convenient for you or not. For most people, that's going to be the accumulation of about one to two hours per day of walking around. Where do these numbers come from? These comes from the study of modern-day hunter-gatherers in, uh, and also anthropological data in terms of how far tribes would necessarily move in, over the course of a day. We know that they often are moving anywhere from five miles on the low end to up to 14 miles to 20 miles, often hauling stuff depending on the season and the time. But they are definitely moving way more than uh, we modern-day humans do. And what we now also know, 
And, well, I shouldn't say no because science is always emerging. What I will say, what the science is hinting at or what we think we know is that if you take an individual who's moving a lot throughout the day, walking around, and not doing any exercise, they are probably going to fare better in terms of the way they look, feel, and function looking good, feeling good, and living longer, health and fitness, than somebody who doesn't move all day, sits on the cubicle or the couch all day, and then goes and does a 30-minute CrossFit workout. The person who's moving all day is probably going to be faring much better. So as I get into this, this, this discussion, what you need to understand in my mind is that this means that we are moving in general. You must be moving. You have no choice. My recommendations for most people on the low end, 5,000 steps per day, that's about an hour of exercise or walking for most people. 10,000 steps is about two hours of walking up to 20,000 steps, which can be four hours of walking. This is critical, and it's not exercise. It's movement, and it has to be done. It is more powerful than probably exercise. But then we get into the discussion of what types of movements or what types of exercise, rather, should we be doing when we exercise. Now, one of the things that this podcast is built on and my work has been built on is the idea that you are uniquely different. You have a unique metabolic expression, a unique psychology, and personal preferences that make you different. Some people just like to run. They feel better when they run. It's the thing they want to do. Some people like yoga. Some people like weight training. Some people like bodybuilding. Some people like CrossFit. Some people want to swim for, you know, play, you know, swam in college and high school as their sport. And some people played tennis in high school and college as their sport. Everyone is very different. But one of the myths that we want to get out of the way right away is this idea that we can do a particular exercise and look the way that those individuals look. For example, if you take a marathon runner and you look at him or, him or her and they're an elite marathon runner, a professional, they do it for a living, taking up marathon running, you might think that that is going to make you look like that particular individual. And that almost never happens because – it is not the way you think. People don't look the way they look because of what they do. They do what they do because of the way they look. Let me give you an example of this. From the time I was young, I was a pretty muscular, mesomorphic type of guy. The first sport I ever played was soccer, which is a lot of running. And I remember my father asking me after the first season of soccer was over, did I like the sport and did I want to do it again next year? And I remember telling him then, I hate all the running. Of course, then I got put into football, which is the short, powerful bursts of activity. And that suited me great because I could burst and I could rest. In other words, sprinting based versus longer running based. So soccer was something that I did not thrive at and therefore didn't like. Football was something I thrived at and therefore liked. In other words, I was built for football, and because I was more built for football, I chose football as my sport. I was never going to be, and even today if I took up marathon running, I'm never going to go and start looking like a marathon runner. So there's, that's one thing that people need to understand. You're not going to look like me necessarily if you start lifting a bunch of heavy weights. You might get some movement in my direction, just like I might get some movement in the direction of a marathon runner if I did that activity. But the truth is I will never, ever look like that. And you will probably, if you're you know, sort of an endomorph and thin, you'll probably never, ever look like me. And so the idea that people look the way they look because of what they do is oftentimes not the case. Certainly some people that happens with. That certainly can happen. But more often than not, People do what they do, right, and then they choose the thing that suits them. So a mesomorphic, anabolic, sprinter-based guy like me is going to choose a sport that he can excel at. Someone who's thin and has good running economy and long limbs and, 
you know, uh, that kind of thing, they're going to choose running. It's just going to feel better, and they're typically going to excel at it. So that makes a lot of sense, hopefully, to you now, and you're not going to make the mistake of saying, hey, if I start doing yoga, I'm all, all of a sudden going to be the most limber person in the world and start looking like a yogini. No, you're certainly going to be more limber, and you may be more, a little more flexible, but I'm never going to be able to do some of the things that they can do. I may never be able to be able to do that. So that's important to understand. So now let's get into this idea then of what should I do? How, if I want to look good, which is where we're going to focus this equation, if I want to look good, which is different than sort of feeling good and living longer, how do I want to manage this? If I want to build muscle and burn fat, how do I want to manage this? Well, let's talk about traditional aerobic exercise first because there's been a lot of talk about how it's so bad for your hormones and how it will raise cortisol levels and how it might strip muscle off your body and how you should never do it. Here's the things that you need to be aware of with traditional aerobic exercise. Now, this to me would be aerobic zone training, spin classes, jogging, marathon running, 5Ks and things like that. Basically, someone who goes out and as their dominant form of activity every day exercise is they run. They go for a jog, they do a spin class, they do a step class, they are involved in uh, running sports, and that's how they get their exercise. Is this good or is this bad? Well, if it's their personal preference and they love it, I would say this is absolutely what you need to do. The idea that you're going to tell someone who loves to run to stop running and start doing a bunch of weight training is absolutely ludicrous. However, if you want to look better and you're not getting the results from that sport, whether you love it or not, your metabolism doesn't care. Just because you like something and you enjoy doing it does not mean your metabolism is going to give you the results you want from it. And so those are two different things. What you like may not be the thing that will get you the results. When it comes to traditional aerobic exercise done in the aerobic zone, what we know is it can have huge benefits. The research shows it has huge benefits for heart health. It has huge benefits for mood enhancement. As a matter of fact, traditional aerobic exercise is the best thing for anti-depression out of any other exercise studied. It's also very good for the heart. Interestingly enough, it can in some people, not everyone, so we got to be careful about this, but it can in some people, especially the long duration stuff, cause some increased hunger and increased cravings. As a matter of fact, and I'll try to remember to post this in the show notes, there was a recent study last year that I read on postmenopausal women doing aerobic exercise training to lose weight. And what they found is a significant proportion of those women, I think it was up to 20%, actually overcompensated in their food intake as a result of the exercise. In other words, a certain percentage, a very high percentage of these women, around 20%, if my recollection is correct, ended up eating more than they would have otherwise if they had not done the exercise. And they ate enough more that it completely overcompensated for the amount of energy they burned. For example, maybe they went out and ran, and as a result of that activity, burned up 300 calories. But as a result of the overcompensation, as a result of doing that, they ended up consuming 500 calories as an example. In other words, as a result of doing the exercise, they were more likely to be in caloric surplus. In that case, if you're trying to cl- create a calorie deficit, it would have been better, they would have been better off not doing that exercise in the first place. And this was highlighted back, I believe, in 2012, and a Time magazine actually did a whole article on this, on some of the research that shows that some people, again, we have to be careful, some people, not all, and probably not even most, but some people can overcompensate with traditional aerobic exercise and end up craving brownies and cupcakes and cookies. As a matter of fact, the Time Magazine article had a woman running on the treadmill and a little thought cloud coming out from her head that (laughs) had donuts and pancakes and a cupcake in that thought cloud, right? Because essentially what it was essentially saying is that, hey, for some of us, when we do a lot of this type of activity, we end up eating way more food than we need, and it actually offsets the amount of calories we burn. So that is a That is something that we want to consider, especially if you're someone who's taken up running because you thought that it would get you the results in weight loss and you found that you're either not losing weight or maybe even gaining weight. Now, the other thing here is what about the hormonal effects of traditional aerobic exercise? Here's what you need to know. 
every type, type of exercise you do, with the exception of very relaxing yoga, restorative type yoga, tai chi, and slow relaxing walking. All types of exercise, with the exception of those three, are going to raise cortisol levels. If you do power walking, you're going to raise your cortisol levels. If you do power yoga, you're going to raise your cortisol levels. If you do high-intensity interval training, you're going to raise your cortisol levels. If you do intense weight training, you're going to raise your cortisol levels. As a matter of fact, this is a good thing. So the idea that people are saying, oh, well, we'll raise your cortisol levels. Well, we want our cortisol levels raised while we're doing exercise. That has huge benefit. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. In other words, it helps us burn up our fat stores. So cortisol is very useful during exercise. If you do the right type of exercise, especially more intense type of stuff, not only do you get cortisol being high, but you also get the release of human growth hormone and testosterone. And believe it or not, human growth hormone and testosterone along with cortisol are amazing because human growth hormone and testosterone amplify cortisol's fat burning effects and block some of cortisol's muscle-burning effects as well. And so you have this nice hormonal soup, this nice multitasking hormonal soup when you get human growth hormone combined with cortisol and testosterone. That hormonal makeup usually occurs more in short-duration, high-intensity exercise like high-intensity interval training, sprint training, short metabolic workouts, short duration, uh, bodybuilding type workouts with weights, typically you get that effect. In aerobic, traditional aerobic exercise, you typically don't get the same human growth hormone testosterone response. But the most important, it's still not really a problem. What's more of a problem is whether cortisol is raised and elevated at high levels later on in the day. And what we know is at least in elite runners, people who run all the time and do it at a high level, they have lower resting cortisol levels than people who don't run, uh, and that is very, very beneficial for them. So let me say that again. You don't want high cortisol levels when you're at rest. You do want high cortisol levels when you're exercising. Traditional aerobic exercise seems to, when people are trained, seems to lower our cortisol levels at rest. And so that can be a good thing. However, overdoing it, overdoing this type of activity because you don't get the same surge in human growth hormone and testosterone could, in some people, cause some loss of muscle along with some loss of fat. And so these are all things that you need to consider. So just to review really quickly, right? So yes, if you love traditional aerobic exercise, absolutely, not only should you do it, you have to do it. Because if you stop doing it, you'll probably stop doing any type of exercise, which is not going to serve you. However, at the same time, you want to be aware that some people, perhaps including you, maybe not most people, but some people, and you might be one of them, can overcompensate with increased food intake from traditional aerobic exercise. In one study I quoted, I believe it's 20% in that particular study, and I believe those women were postmenopausal. So we need to be aware of that if we're trying to look good from the things that we are doing in the exercise realm. And then, of course, we want to realize that if we're overdoing something that is raising cortisol levels unopposed, meaning you're not getting growth hormone responses and testosterone responses with it, we could potentially be stripping off muscle, which, again, if we're trying to look good, is not something we would want to be doing. However, you can have some benefits in resting cortisol levels. And so that is important to understand. So should you do, be doing traditional aerobic exercise or not? The question is, is it working for you? And hopefully this discussion helps you know whether it's working for you. By the way, how would you know, and I've covered this so many times now, but I'll mention it again and again and again, how would you know if traditional aerobic training, your spin class, your step class, your jogging session, your marathon training program, how would you know it's working for or against your metabolism? Well, if your heck goes out of check, H-E-C, hunger, energy, and cravings, if your heck goes out of check, it may be an indication that you may begin to overcompensate and that exercise session is working against you. Now, here's another interesting thing from the research. We know pretty clearly that when you take traditional aerobic exercise and you add into that traditional weight training, the two are synergistic for fat burning and muscle building. For example, if Monday you go for a run and Tuesday you lift weights and then Wednesday you go for a run and then Thursday you lift weights and then Friday you go for a run and then Saturday you lift weights, that is far better in terms of fat loss 
and muscle building potentially than either alone. In other words, if you just did six days of running, you wouldn't get the muscle building effects. In fact, you may actually lose some muscle along with the fat that you burn. And maybe if you're an overcompensator, you didn't lose the fat at all, and maybe you even gained some as a result of, tra- of traditional aerobic exercise. However, when you add in the weight training, now you won't lose the muscle, and you may even gain some of that muscle. And, if, and what will happen is because you're now not doing six days of aerobic training and only doing three, perhaps now your body is less stressed. And so we've seen in the research that one of the best ways to build muscle and burn fat is to combine traditional aerobic exercise with weight training. Now, many people have done this different ways. Some people do them the same day. They'll do 30 minutes of cardio and then do weights or 30 minutes of weights and then do cardio. Or they'll do cardio one day, weight training the next day. Or the new thing that we now know can be perhaps even more beneficial is a combination of uh, in the same workout, what we call an integrated workout, what is known as metabolic conditioning, where maybe one minute you're doing a 400-meter run and then the next minute you're doing some deadlifts or something like that. Uh, My friend Jen Sinkler has a great way of saying this, that sometimes you don't even need to do any cardio at all. If you set up a weight training circuit, maybe deadlifts and you know, power cleans and squats and those kinds of things, and you do them all in a circuit without resting, what will happen is you're sort of lifting weights, quote, faster. Faster meaning not the cadence by which you pick up, pick the weights up and put them down, but you're taking shorter rest periods between the, the weight lifting moves. And as a result, what's going to happen? You're going to have your breathless component go up. And so you're getting a cardiovascular response without even needing to do traditional cardio. And most people nowadays who are maximizing their efforts in the gym and trying to build muscle and burn fat at the same time are doing a really amazing job with taking these metabolic, quote, metabolic conditioning workouts and getting great, great results in terms of their physiques. If you want to know the most popular regime that's doing this, CrossFit is sort of a style that does this. My old company, Metabolic Effect, used to do this same style using dumbbells. CrossFit does this style mainly using barbells. Of course, there are some cardio-based moves in CrossFit, but, you know, some of their most popular workouts can be very, very cardiovascularly taxing yet have no running or rowing or jump roping or any cardiovascular movement in them at all, and yet they can be highly effective in burning fat and building muscle. One of the things we also know is that when you're doing traditional aerobic exercise by itself, it tends to be the highest calorie burn of most activities, meaning that if you do weight training, you're not going to burn many calories. If you do a run, a jog for 40 minutes, you're going to burn way more calories than if you did weight training for 40 minutes, especially traditional slow bodybuilding weight training. However, in the traditional aerobic group, once you stop the activity, you stop the calorie burn. However, when you're doing things like CrossFit and metabolic conditioning that uses weights or you're doing traditional bodybuilding or powerlifting and things like that, what happens is once you stop working out, The body needs to recover from the damage that's being done to the muscle. It needs to then repair that damage, and then it oftentimes starts to use energy to adapt and get stronger, maybe building more connective tissue, maybe building more muscle, et cetera. That recovery, repair, and adaptation process, which does happen with traditional aerobic exercise, just way, way less, that process uses a lot of calories and this is why you see in the research some studies have shown this can last up to two hours after a workout where you get this enhanced calorie burn 16 hours have been shown 48 hours have been shown 72 hours have even been shown of a what they call excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or a afterburn a metabolic effect that can last hours and days after the workout. Now, most of the ones that showed 48 hours and things like that are workouts that are far too intense for your average exerciser to engage in. However, we do know that if you do an intense workout with weights, 
you can amplify the calorie burn for many hours and perhaps days after the workout. And that's what we want, right? We want to be able to be in the gym for 20 minutes and then have a enhanced calorie burn for 20 hours rather than being out on the road pounding the pavement for 40 minutes and only getting a 40-minute afterburn effect from that, right? That's what we want, 20 minutes in the gym, 20-hour calorie burn versus 40 minutes on the road and only a 40-minute afterburn. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. So if you want to look good, it is probably far better to maximize your time with a combination of cardio and weight training. And this can be done any way you want. One day cardio, one day weights, you know, another day where you have maybe cardio and weights combined in the same workout, or maybe even moving to something like CrossFit or metabolic conditioning workouts and things like that. One more hint I'll give you here in terms of what you want to try to accomplish. You can use biofeedback within your workout as well. I call it the B's and the H's, two B's and two H's, breathless, burning, heavy, and heat. These are the different biofeedback parameters that can clue you into what's going on with the hormonal response to exercise. The burning effect happens as a result of the increase of protons that builds up in your muscles. Lactate is then released to grab hold of these protons and form lactic acid. A lot of times people believe lactic acid causes the burn that you feel in your muscles when you're under intense exercise. That's actually not true. Lactic acid is actually buffering against the burn. In other words, your body creates that lactate to bind up that, those extra protons and form lactic acid so there's less burning in the muscle. And so lactate has now been seen as a performance-enhancing uh, product uh, and it's also now been shown to be a hormone in its own right. In other, in other words, more burning equals more lactate, and more lactate equals a higher secretion of human growth hormone. And so because of that, we can oftentimes equate more burning in a workout with a greater human growth hormone production. We also, and there's also uh, testosterone there too, but a little bit more human growth hormone than testosterone. So when I think burning in my muscles, I think human growth hormone. Heavy and straining on the muscles where you have this heavy weight where you can't lift the weight anymore. You know, burning, you can reach metabolic failure because the burn gets so much that you just have to stop. Or you can reach mechanical failure where the weight is just so heavy, you get too much strain on your muscles and it can't overcome the force of gravity. Well, that mechanical strain, that heavy component, is more of a testosterone uh, sort of amplifier. And so the burn is more human growth hormone and a little bit of testosterone, and the sort of mechanical heavy strain is more testosterone and a little less human growth hormone. Also, the breathless effect, what happens when you go breathless in a workout? Well, the lungs need to work and deliver more oxygen and blow off more CO2, right? Well, what hormone do they have at their advantage to make that happen? Well, if someone starts getting uh, you know, closed off airways, what do you give them? You give them an EpiPen, an epinephrine pen, epinephrine adrenaline, right? And so when you do intense work and you start to get breathless, your body will release adrenaline to dilate the uh, bronchioles to help you get more oxygen. That adrenaline also amplifies fat burning, speeds heart rate, does a lot of other things. And so you can equate breathlessness with catecholamine release. And the catecholamines are some of our best fat burners, right? And then, of course, hot and sweaty, which is probably the worst biofeedback, but it's still there. The hotter you get in a workout, the more you sweat. It's a, it's a fairly good indication, not the best, that you've also activated the sympathetic nervous system and are getting more of these adrenaline responses. For those of you who are big science nerds, the sweating response is a sympathetic response, so you would think it would be adrenaline that's controlling that, but it's actually acetylcholine. It's one of the weird ones in the sympathetic thing, but it is it does give an indication that you have activated the sympathetic response. So breathless, burning, heavy, and heat. Breathless, human growth hormone and testosterone, right? Or breathless, adrenaline, rather. Burning, human growth hormone and testosterone. Heavy testosterone and human growth hormone and hot and sweaty, a, a large calorie burn and sympathetic excess. You want workouts that deliver the B's and the H's. If you can get a workout that delivers all of those B's and H's at the same time, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get a pretty big amplification of calorie burn throughout 
your workout and in the hours and perhaps days after the workout, which is going to have a hugely beneficial effect for you in terms of looking good and making that uh, sort of your uh, major goal set. Now, I'll say one more thing here because you might say, well, some people can overcompensate with increased calorie intake from traditional aerobic exercise. Can that happen with other types of exercise? It absolutely can, but in my reading of the research, oftentimes, and you don't even have to read the research for this, but short duration, very high intense workout, 10 minutes of work, sprint training, high intensity or interval training, um, those kinds of things, CrossFit, oftentimes you will feel nauseous after those workouts and not want to eat for several hours after those workouts. So there's a short-term, usually appetite suppressing effect when you are you know, doing high-intensity, short-duration stuff. And that you can use that to your advantage, where you can get something healthier on board at that time that's healthier and less calories, maybe like a whey protein shake or something like that. And you can use that to your advantage so you don't end up, you know, eating donuts and cheesecake later as a result of your exercise session. So in general, what the research says is that walking, so neat, just the stuff we need to be doing every day so long as it's slow and relaxed, will have very little impact on hunger and cravings for most people, partly because walking lowers cortisol. It's very good at doing that. When you think cortisol, think C, cortisol, C, craving C. In other words, cortisol may be directly linked to cravings because the higher cortisol levels you have, the more you shut off the motivation centers in the brain and the more you activate the reward centers in the brain. And this is why that woman on the front of Time magazine cover running on the treadmill, raising her cortisol levels, may be craving cupcakes and cookies and things like that. Just don't make the mistake to think that's going to be everybody. So in general, lots of walking should not trigger hunger and cravings. Short duration, high intensity stuff should have a slight appetite reducing effect for the short term. And then rest assured, after a few hours, you will get a spike. Looks like moderate intensity, longer duration stuff, you may have a fairly significant increase in this. And then one thing I'll say across the board that the research hints at, that well-trained people in any arena, if you are fit, there tends to be a a circumstance where fit, trained individuals, no matter what they're doing, whether it's CrossFit, running, lifting, whatever, seem to have better appetite regulation across the board over the long run. So we look at acute effects, and then we can see when people are trained, they tend to have better, uh, you know, sort of control of hunger, energy, and cravings. Heck. So anyway, hopefully this helps you sort of understand some of the arguments around uh, training, weight training, lifting, and things like that. I'm right at my 30-minute mark, so I'm going to end here. Please do me a favor. Go leave me a review. I would love to hear from you guys, and I will see you at the next podcast. Pop it in real quick just to say thank you so much for your interest and support of the JTTA.com podcast. I am bringing back by popular demand the live Q&A calls I used to do back in the day where you can get on live with me, ask your question directly, and have me answer it in full. Questions about thyroid and adrenal health, autoimmune disease, any health condition, belly fat, muscle building, performance enhancement, you name it, we are going to cover it on the Q&A podcast. If you'd like to be on these live Q&A calls with me and speak to me directly, all you need to do is become a patron of the podcast. You can go to www.patreon.com backslash jtita. That's www.patreon.com slash jtita. Become a patron of of the podcast i would greatly appreciate your support and you'll be able to access me live to answer all your questions in depth thanks again for your support see you on the podcast